morning. Uh, happy to have you here for our today's press conference on the European Environment Agency's uh, sixth report on the state of environment. We have here today uh, Executive Vice President Franz Timmermans, we have Commissioner Virginia Sinkevicius, and the Executive Director of the Environment Agency, um, Hans Breinings. Please, Vice President. Thank you very much. Um, it's nice to be back here. You know me by now, I think, after five years. But you're going to get a load of this guy. He's going to be one of our stars. Um, I really have huge trust in him. We will be working together uh, jointly on which is, what is, I think, a transformational agenda uh, for the world and for the European Union. I also really want to welcome Hans Breinings. He's delivered a report. He will be talking about that in a moment that underscores in all its elements the urgency of the mission we have. Um, the Kinews and I are very much committed to do what is actually the message in this report, and that is there's no time to waste. Uh, we're running out of time. We're not delivering on what we've promised. Um, now, you know, I was in a discussion this morning about the same issue in the Committee of the Regions, and then you get people saying, yes, okay, we need to do something, but jobs might be threatened, our industry, etc. You know, just imagine there would be a comet heading to Earth, and uh, scientists see it coming, and they say it's going to hit Earth in 30 years if we don't do anything. What would we then do? Would we then also say, well, yeah, let's, let's not hurry too much, and let's look at it, don't do too much? No, we would have this sense of urgency, and humankind, as it is, would say, let's fix this. And this would be my message also uh, uh, to Hans, to the agency, to others, let's fix this. Because we can fix this. We have the means, we have the technology, we do have the financial means, even if this means fun, uh, uh, investing at least a couple of hundred billions a year. Um, but we could do this. And what this report also does, uh, but don't want to mow the grass uh, away in front of your feet, but what, what this report also does, in my view, is to show what happens if you don't do anything. Because many people are always arguing this is going to be so expensive. But what will the cost be if we don't do anything? Much, much higher. And then we will not have the benefits. I find it, as um, an official, but especially as a, as a father, unacceptable that our children need to grow up in cities with such poor air quality that it directly impedes on their, on their health. I find it unacceptable that the water quality that we have is below par, even uh, on uh, World Health Organization standards. I find it unthinkable that we would allow species to disappear at the rate they're disappearing now. I think we cannot afford not to look at pesticides, at endocrine disruptors, and other things. So we have a huge task. I think, you know, uh, with uh, the people in charge here, we have an opportunity uh, to do something about it. Um, the European Commission will present our plans for the Green Deal next week. Um, and I hope they will convince everyone that we need a paradigm shift, a real systemic change. This is no longer about correcting the margins. This is about really changing. And I honestly hope that when Hans does his presentation, uh, he will underscore uh, that element, but that's entirely up to him. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for uh, being here, and thanks for the opportunity to present, indeed, the state and outlook of the Environment Report. It's a report which we do every five years, and it brings together the best knowledge on environment and climate issues and gives an update on where we stand it links it to the key policy domains and then looks at a way forward. And I think it's uh, important to say that at this moment, the, the report is extremely clear indeed on the message of we are facing unprecedented and interconnected challenges and time is running out. Whether you look at climate change, where it's uh, obvious that we are not on a trajectory to be well below two degrees, as we, as we agreed in Paris, on biodiversity, where since 2000, the EU has said we would halt biodiversity loss, and 20 years later, we are not near this. So we keep seeing 
species going extinct, or on resource use, which gets little attention actually, but is the foundation of our economy, how we use resources and how we keep them in the economy in a much more sustainable way with less impact on human health, on biodiversity and on climate. I think it's clear that there is no more business as usual. From now on, it's business as unusual. And I think the policy responses that are embedded in the European Green Deal are indeed pointing in the direction of a policy business as unusual. We are dealing with urgency. It's important to point out that we are already dealing with irreversibilities. Climate change is happening. Species are lost. Uh, we see soil degradation that is not reversible in the short term. So irreversibilities are already part of the uh, problem we are facing. We are talking about tipping points which could speed up the negative spiral of unsustainability and we understand better that all of these things are interconnected. And in policy terms, this means that if we fail on the circular economy, we will fail on biodiversity and on climate change. If we fail on climate change, it will have impacts on the two others and the same for the third. You know? Now, we mapped the performance, you could say, of how uh, Europe's environment is evolving and we linked that to European policy targets and objectives. And I think the message there is clear. While we have made progress in a number of areas, and I think in the climate change package that will reach its end point in 2020, that is obvious. Europe is the only region that has stuck to its climate promises until now. They have delivered, and we see better air quality and better water quality and less industrial pollution. Overall, there is a very serious implementation gap. There are too many places in Europe where the policies that we have agreed are not implemented. Our, our color scheme of where we stand colors too much red, yeah? and we would see much more green if countries would have implemented what was uh, agreed. Overall, the reason why we are worried about the future boils down to the following point. We are not addressing the critical pressure points on the environment, on natural capital, and on climate. And they come down to sectors. They come down to systems, the energy system, the food system, the transport and mobility system, and the built environment. They use too much energy and of the wrong kind. They use too many resources that are not kept in their materials and their value in the cycle. They have too much impact on biodiversity and on human health. And indeed, these systemic approaches, which I think are foundational also in what we know of the Green Deal, they hint at uh, a different type of policy making. But on top of a different type, we also know that we will need to speed up and scale up solutions. Yeah? And at the same time, to create the space in our society and in our economy to speed up and scale up solutions, I think it's paramount that we also speed up and scale up what we should stop doing. And that is making uh, or giving subsidies that are not compatible with this agenda, that is moving out of investments that are not compatible with this agenda, that is uh, supporting tax systems that are not driving this agenda forward. So it's both speeding up and scaling up of solutions and creating the space by speeding up and scaling up what we should no longer do. We also attribute quite a bit of attention to the social justice dimension in the agenda. There is a lot of talk about we want to avoid stranded assets. I would say we have just as much responsibility to avoid stranded workers and stranded regions in Europe. And that is where I think a lot of attention will have to be paid. A big risk, and I'm nearing the end of my, my short introduction, a big risk is that we would make the wrong investments. Yeah. Investments that are costly because they are focusing on marginal efficiency gains in the systems that we already have. And ask any engineer or economist, they will say that marginal efficiencies become increasingly costly and we know that they will not lead us to 2050 objectives. So they are dead end streets, they are not leading to the fundamental transitions that we need. Improving the combustion engine or improving the performance of coal-fired power plants is not the way forward. Yeah. So we need to move from a logic of investments in dead-end streets 
to investments in the breakthrough technologies and solutions towards the future. A final point that I would like to make is that you can, you can proclaim this from a press room and from the decision-making rooms in Brussels or in other capitals in Europe, but this will involve whole societies. We are talking about societal transitions. So we will need to involve the creative potential, the energy, the, uh, the enthusiasm also for this type of agenda uh, across Europe at different scales in our cities. And that's, that's where we will have to bring this agenda. That's what we're, where it will come to life, not only in big reports. Yeah? And I, of course, encourage you to read the report. But it, it, it has to become a life, a life agenda for European society. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Brönings and his team at European Environment Agency experts who contributed to this excellent, clear, evidence-based document which sends an, an emergency message. But first of all, it's also at the very right timing, just a week before the European Green Deal going to be published. And it will be always a great evidence to return, take a look where we are, and that this is why we need those decisions to be fostered. I'm also glad that this press conference is led by the Executive Vice President Franz Timmermans. SOER 2020, when sums up the five past years progress, identifies three major shortages. So systemic strategic approach, which was lacking, implementation gap, and of course addressing public finances so that they would definitely promote sustainability. This all can be only achieved at the executive le level with the crucial role in leading. Speaking on the positive note, uh, this report also very clearly states that you managed to reduce some pressure, not enough, but some pressure, while still enhancing prosperity and well-being of our citizens. I'm glad that for my mandate, I feel that is direct response to SOER 2020. Three major tasks for me, Biodiversity Strategy 2030. It's a direct response for protection of our environment, which is clearly showing the trends it wasn't enough. And don't get me wrong, strategy is not going to be enough. Implementation gap also has to be filled. It also has to be funded enough. But most importantly, we also have to get everything in order, in order to be credible outside the EU. As we speak of use of resources, which is highlighted again at, at, in the report, circular economy action plan will be the answer for that. But it is important to get businesses involved and create a market for them. Those SMEs, pioneers, who will be the first ones offering circular economy solutions, they have to be funded and have a good access to capital. When we speak about citizens' health problems, zero pollution ambition is important cornerstone of, of the Green Deal, but of course also of my mission letter. It is only it is not only that EU finds itself in, in this junction, it's the whole planet. But it is very important to get our house in order, fixing every corner of it, then we can only be credible in the world. We can come with our agenda and negotiate with our partners. I would say that we cannot predict the future, but we can definitely create it. And this report, evidence-based, with excellent data gathered, shows that very clearly. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll go for the questions, please. Thank you. Um, my name is Remo Hess. I work for Swiss newspaper, Sarkauer Zeitung, Luzerner Zeitung, and St. Galler Tagblatt. I have a question for Vice President Timmermans. Um, the first is about language. Um, you talked about urgency, climate urgency. Would you agree with the European Parliament um, who decided last week that it's not urgency, that it's rather um, climate emergency that we're dealing with? 
And um, secondly, um, the paradigm shift, as you described it, will affect the personal life of millions of citizens. So I wanted to ask you what um, commitments are you personally ready to make? I don't know if you already already are vegetarian. or um, So um, will you stop eating meat and, and will you stop taking the plane? And thirdly, I want to ask you, would you also um, advocate to um, abolish uh, the seat of the European Parliament in Strasbourg in order to reduce um, carbon emissions? First of all, since uh, a year at least, I've been consistently talking about the climate crisis. Uh, so if I said urgency uh, just now, it doesn't mean that I am more on the side of urgency and less on the side of emergency. You know, I've been con consistently using the strongest terms I can find for this crisis because it is um, a direct threat uh, to our existence uh, and we should be treating it in that way. Um, secondly, on... Uh, um, uh, what, I, what I would do personally, hey, I have to make changes in my life and I'm learning day by day. Sometimes it's my kids educating me, telling me that I should change uh, uh, my habits. Uh, we as a family have become sort of flexitarian more than anything else. Uh, but, uh, you know, if I compare the amounts of meat we eat uh, now uh, to the past, it's changed. But it's not a burden, it sort of happens naturally. Where, we really, where I really need to, to start looking into, which I hadn't done in the past, is what is my carbon footprint? Uh, um, uh, what are we doing in terms of our mobility? Are we uh, using bikes when we can? Uh, should we not be buying another car? I mean, and I think most, of, uh, most citizens, if you look at, at patterns in member states, are making these, are, are thinking about this. And in that sense, I'm just an ordinary uh, uh, citizen. Um, um, and uh, in terms of travel, you know, I had a discussion on Dutch television about this earlier this week. It would make a huge difference if we would start taking the train on distances that are, let's say, within uh, the reach of a couple of hours. Uh, the planes going from Amsterdam to, to London or Brussels to Paris uh, and even Berlin, that should not be the case. We should be taking trains, but then trains should be there. And this is part, is, has to be part of the Green Deal, that we also help uh, more trains coming. I don't understand why we no longer have the night trains, um, which we had uh, before. And uh, in, in longer distances, it's going to take a, a bit longer at time. Uh, I got the question, uh, are you going to take the train when you go to Madrid? I will not be taking the train when I go to Madrid, because if I take the train to distances above 1,500 kilometers, I would be spending more time in the train than, than doing my job, and that would not be, be a rational a decision. But if we have high-speed trains in the future, of course, we will travel longer distances with a train. Well, I could go on for hours uh, answering your question. Now, of course, the Strasbourg question came up. Um, um, over the course of my uh, career in the last uh, 30 years, yes, that's how old I am, um, uh, this issue came up time and time again. And also as a, as a, as a, um, a government official, I tried many things in the convention. We tried to convince France to look for an alternative, etc., etc. But for now, this hasn't happened. And it's, uh, this is in the hands of, of uh, the Council. Uh, and I, I would think the ideal situation would be uh, is if a parliament would have the right to decide itself uh, where it uh, 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 decides to gather. But that, sadly, would not be in line with the treaties. And as a guardian of the treaty, the Commission has to respect uh, uh, the rules, uh, but politically where I stand, I think is quite clear. Thank you. Please, Marine. Hi, uh, Marine Khan from the Financial Times. Another question to the Executive Vice President. Uh, next week when you unveil your Green New Deal, you will not be presenting your plan for the Just Transition Fund, which is coming uh, probably, we think, uh, next year or early next year. Given that um, delay, what are the chances that you can convince Poland, Hungary and the Czech Republic next week at the European Council Summit to sign up to the 2050 goals, given how important this transition fund or at least the idea of financial aid has become in terms for before they commit to this target? Well, I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, but my colleagues will correct me, I think in the press conference yesterday, President von der Leyen uh, gave an indication of the uh, Just Transition Fund and that it would be in the three-digit uh, area. Um, Sorry? 
yeah, the three-digit area. Um, <laughs> and um, um, how, how this will be uh, uh, constructed and how we we'll organize this, of course, there, is, uh, uh, there are interesting elements in this, and we will have to develop this in a way that is uh, technically completely correct before we come out with this. But it is clear that the Just Transition Fund will be an important element, but at the same time, it is also clear that we need a much broader just transition mechanism, which affects all policy areas and all the means we have also in other financial means of European Union, cohesion funds, structural funds, and the common agricultural policy. All these means should be reoriented towards this uh, paradigm shift in the way our society is structured and our economy is, is structured. So, and I, I do believe that this is the good basis for a discussion I will be meeting uh, the a Czech minister in a moment. Uh, it's a good basis for discussion with those countries who to date are still rather reluctant to commit to uh, 2050 climate neutrality. But I have, have the impression that with a good policy mix, we can convince all member states to be uh, on that line. And I hope we can do that uh, next week in the European Council. Thank you. Please. in the middle, Oliver Kim with the Austrian newspaper, Die Presse. Um, yeah, the Commission last year, when it presented its communication on the different options towards 2050, I think estimated it's going to cost about 250 billion euros in total investments per year, um, private and public, to, you know, be able to make that leap towards carbon neutrality. Uh, will there be... Uh, an indication of where that money would be coughed up uh, next week? Will you be more concrete about where that money is going to come from? That's the first question. Secondly, what happens when the worldwide recession hits next year or something? What happens to the Green New Deal when the first German car plants shut down, when the first Hungarian suppliers of German car plants shut down and so forth and so forth? Aren't you worried that, that you would lose you know, public support for this? And then finally, more concretely, your own country, the Netherlands, started implementing a program to reduce um, the pork industry uh, following uh, a court ruling. Do you think this is a way forward for, the, for all of Europe to think about how the production of meat could possibly be reduced, be rendered more eco-friendly, more sustainable and so forth, given the impact uh, it has on, on the climate, on, on the soil, on water and so forth? Thank you. You know, what happens, what happens? You know, to quote my great literary, uh, literary hero, Asterix, uh, if the sky falls down uh, tomorrow, we're all dead. Um, uh, but um, let me be very clear. Um, I can't be clear enough on this. What happens if we do nothing? What happens if the air quality goes from bad to worse? What happens if there's not 400,000 people who die prematurely because of ad, uh, bad air quality, but a million people? What happens if uh, the uh, enormous disruption of the fourth industrial revolution is just ignored uh, uh, by us and is taken up by other parts of the world so that we are uh, imposed all these things? What is the cost of all of that if we do nothing? What is the cost of not uh, doing uh, mitigation and adaptation? What happens if, we, uh, uh, if this erratic weather uh, happens more and more? What happens if in Spain a gota fria is not an event every 50 years but uh, uh, every five months? What happens then? So I think it is really urgent to not just talk about the cost of this transition but also talk about the cost of not making this uh, transition, of great urgency uh, to do that. And as far as the investment uh, uh, capacities or investment needs are uh, uh, concerned. This will be a combination of public funds, of loans, of private funds. I mean, industry, if you talk to the car industry today, you talk to a different car industry than five years ago. The car industry understands that for them, this is a real shift towards uh, another way of, uh, another type of uh, mobility. Um, uh, and this is not just because of a green deal. This is because of what's happening in society. Um, I don't know about you, but if I talk to my kids, my kids are not interested anymore in owning. For my grandparents, having a car was impossible. For people, you know, from, from, from our working class background, for my grandparents, a car was something just for very rich people. For my dad, the car, having a car was the expression of the fact that he succeeded in life. 
Um, and for me, the car was a great thing to have. For my kids, they want mobility. And this is going to change society, and this is going to change the automotive industry. Uh, and, and that's, you can't solve that, as Hans said, by making a more efficient diesel engine. Um, and so we need to invest in batteries, we need to invest in hydrogen economy, et cetera, et cetera. And these are huge amounts of money. But I think if you compare those amounts of money to the amounts of money that will be lost if we don't do anything, it is relatively modest. And by the way, if we lead on this and we become the first climate neutral uh, continent in 2050, we will also lead in the world's economy in many, many uh, uh, ways. And this will create uh, huge amounts of new jobs. But you have to be realistic. Such a paradigm shift is painful and complicated and needs uh, levels of governance unprecedented in our history at all levels, global, uh, European, national, regional, and local. And this is arguably the biggest challenge, bigger challenge than uh, the money uh, involved. As far as agriculture is concerned, the, the final part of your question, I don't think you can have sort of a one-size-fits-all approach for all member states. It depends very, very much on the conditions uh, uh, you are faced with. My own country has been faced um, with challenges in the uh, uh, husbandry area for decades, decades. Um, I remember very much when, when I started off working in the uh, latter part of the 1980s, we already had a huge uh, nitrate crisis in the Netherlands because of indeed big farming and other farming. So um, the choices made there um, uh, can, uh, do not have to lead to um, eliminating that farming, but it's interesting to see in my country the debate, should we be this huge exporter? It's a question, I'm not saying uh, decisions have been taken. What can we do in terms of, for instance, animal feed to make sure that uh, animals do not uh, contribute to the extent they do now uh, to uh, uh, um, uh, uh, a negative effect on our, on our environment? But these are debates, and, and the, the, the NOx issue now in the Netherlands is, 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 is very uh, acute. But these are debates you cannot compare one country to, to the other. And, you know, as a Dutchman, I have to say, um, even though sometimes it's difficult and painful, um, we've always found a way out, uh, and also in, in close cooperation with the farming uh, community. And uh, you now see that the farming community is, is really looking for real substantial changes uh, to also uh, see a future uh, for themselves. Thanks. Over there, please. Okay. Over here, then, you had the question. Hello. Uh, Simon Taylor, um, writing for the Daily Telegraph today. Um, uh, sorry, to give you your full title, Executive Vice President Timmermans, um, could you just tell us what the Commission's thinking is on the carbon border adjustment tax uh, today? Because uh, um, President von der Leyen seemed to be backtracking a little bit um, in Madrid, uh, when she spoke in Madrid, uh, when was it? Uh, earlier this week or something. Monday, thank you. Um, and in your answer, could you address the what? Because you're, presumably you're going to face a lot of resistance from member states and from lobbies who say it's all very well for the EU to set more ambitious climate or greenhouse gas reduction goals, but all the production is going to shift to parts of the world that don't have similar climate, um, or, uh, um, you know, emissions limits. Um, so. Um, are you still wedded to the idea that a carbon border adjustment tax is the way to deal with that problem, or how does it how does it stand at the moment? Thanks. My thinking on this is is, is as follows: um, we all subscribe to the Paris Goals internationally, and the European Union is now proposing measures to get us where we need to be by by 2050. I think it is fair to ask of other parts of the world who've also subscribed to these goals that they take similar me measures or other measures that will also get them there. If that happens, there is no need to have a correction at the border. You don't need uh, a mechanism to correct uh, for imbalances. 
But if other parts of the world don't take these measures, I think it is our duty as Europeans to protect our industry and our economy against unfair competition on the basis of a much larger carbon footprint. Um, and I think that, that is the nature of the uh, mechanism we're thinking about uh, to correct um, uh, at the border if that is necessary. But I would go through it in this order because is it so, so outrageous for us to ask of other parts of the world who've subscribed uh, to uh, the Paris uh, uh, Agreement that they also take the measures to implement uh, the Paris Agreement? But if they don't, and we do, there will be discrepancies that will need to be corrected at the border, and we will take the measures necessary to do that if it is necessary. Would you like to follow up quickly on that one? Yeah, tiny numerical follow-up. Is the 250 billion euros a year still the figure you're working with that was in the Commission's report? And secondly, are you in favor of a tax, the, the border thing? which would mean that you would be probably get tangled up in the unanimity problems in ECOFIN and so forth, or should it rather, and maybe also in a WTO problem, or would you rather say it should be some kind of bland sounding mechanism that might be politically more feasible, some sort of stitching imports into the emissions trading system in a very technical way? Thank you. Um, I, I think I, I don't want to be bin down on an exact number in terms of the investment needed because it is a complex issue with, with many, many uh, sources and also a lot of private uh, uh, contribution to that. Uh, I know that there's been a range that was used, I think between 180 and, and 300 something. Um, the one thing that we need to, to understand is we're talking about hundreds of billions of euros per year. I think that's, that's, that would be my, my, my position on that, not to be... Uh, pinpointed to an exact uh, a number. On the issue of the, well, first of all, more generally on taxation. There is no way we can do all of this if we don't take a long and hard look at taxation per se. If we say, don't look at taxation uh, because that's too complicated, it's not going to happen. Uh, you know, we will have to look at taxing for instance. Why are we taxing? fuels when we put them in cars or when they are used to drive trains, but we're not taxing fuels when they are put into airplanes. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Um, uh, is our energy taxation uh, system still uh, up to scratch in the, in the framework of the uh, fundamental changes we need to uh, uh, have? Uh, other areas of tax ta taxation will have to be looked into as well. So we can't just put you know, taxation uh, out of the debate because then we won't get there and this is going to be difficult you're absolutely right there's unanimity um, but member states will have to face this and we'll have to have a discussion with member states on that now on the um, carbon border tax it could be a tax it could be part of a mechanism um, but I think uh, also internationally if we agree if the Paris agreement is leading then how would it be in, in violation of WTO rules if you ask other parts of the world also to follow uh, 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 the Paris Agreement? I, I'm, I'm, I think we can do this in a way that is WTO conform. And by the way, even if it is WTO conform, I don't exclude that other states will see this as a reason to, uh, to take measures, but that's, that's for a later date. But the fundamental position here, as far as I'm concerned, is this. If we take far-reaching intrusive measures to ready our society for uh, carbon neutrality, which has huge implications for investments in our industry, and others don't, and this creates a, a, a problem with uh, uh, pricing, because carb the carbon footprint is not priced into one and is priced into the other, then I think the EU is in its full right to correct this at the border. Thank you. I think we have time for one last question, so please. Hi, my name is Matthijs Schiffers. I'm from Het Financiële Dagblad in the Netherlands. Um, this is all a, a new topic for you, uh, climate. Uh, very complicated. Uh, of course, you have very good advisors uh, helping you. They're smart, I know, I understand. <laughs> no, but, but still, I was wondering, how, in, how, how do you manage in such a short time to, to, to get your knowledge up to date? Is there like a specific book you've read or that you could recommend to, to people like us? You know, the thing is, um, 
Um, indeed, uh, you know, the, the Directorate General I'm directly responsible for now, DG Klima, has amazing people and who have been all over me for the last couple of months, training me and understanding all of this. So, so that, that is the first part of an answer to your question. Secondly, I'm not totally a novice in this area. I was responsible for sustainability in the previous uh, commission, so I have been dealing with uh, 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 many of these issues uh, uh, already in the last uh, five years. But indeed, you know, if, if we want to be serious about this, uh, you know, you, we need a, a steep learning curve, and I'm doing all I can uh, to get acquainted uh, uh, with uh, the issue. And, uh, uh, you know, I've been reading a lot... Uh, uh, I was just reading a, an incredibly uh, insightful article written by Professor Pisani from France. I've been reading up on a lot of stuff that was done uh, by Hans and uh, his agency. I have been uh, intimately talking to and listening to and reading stuff uh, produced by, for instance, the Potsdam uh, Institute. And I'm this is just what comes to mind immediately when you ask uh, uh, this question. So I've been doing my, my utmost. Um, to, to be fully uh, briefed. I've talked to, uh, I, I was fortunate to have long sessions with my former colleague, Cañete, uh, who talked me through the negotiations on, uh, uh, where he did an incredible job, negotiations on uh, the Paris Agreement and, and the COP that he's, the COPs that he's been to, uh, well, et cetera, et cetera. That's, this is how, you know, this is, that's, uh, that's how I try and prepare as well as I can for, for this responsibility. Thanks. I said it's the last one, but now we see a very insisting question over there. So please go ahead shortly. Yes. Was it C'est OK? OK. Um, Lisa Iotti, je, uh, je suis italienne, je viens de la de RAI. Alors, euh, hier, j'étais ici euh, à la conférence des présidents. Il a parlé toujours tout, tout le temps des Green Day, Green Day non Alors, aujourd'hui, en Europe, on a des critères d'évaluation des pesticides, vous savez, qui ne euh, euh, sont pas suffisants pour euh, protéger les abeilles et les, 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 les pollinateurs en général. Et vous savez qu'on a perdu les 60% de... Des, des insectes en Europe. Et ça, parce que la, la commission précédente, l'ancienne commission, n'a pas accepté des euh, guides des EFSA. Alors, je me demande si vous êtes en train de faire quelque chose et vous êtes plus, plus ambitieuse. Excusez-moi pour mon français. Et puis, je vous demande une autre chose. Et, comme la, vous, êtes, vous devez parler des PAC, la, la nouvelle PAC, la proposition de réforme de la PAC de l'ancienne commission n'était pas très ambitieuse. Et vous savez que la majorité de, de l'argent va à l'agriculture intensive et ça, ce n'est pas sostenible aujourd'hui. Donc, est-ce que vous voulez la changer, cette PAC Would you like me to answer Yes. yes. Okay. Please, if you wish. Sure. As Vice President would like me to answer, I would go ahead because it's uh, within my portfolio. So, of course, uh, one of the pieces in the Green New Deal is going to be, first of all, is, of course, biodiversity 2030 strategy, which is going to focus a lot on uh, protection of uh, species, on restoration, and, of course, pollinators is one of them. Uh, what is more, more important is, of course, zero pollution ambition, which will focus on air quality, on water quality, but of course on chemicals as well, and on, on chemicals use. Today, it's, uh, uh, we, we, we celebrate Soil Day, so it is very important probably to, to, to mention that there was not enough done measures to protect our soil and land use, which was still uh, leading to uh, degradation within the EU. Report clearly says steps which we need to take, and they will be definitely ref reflected in the Green New Deal and then under zero pollution ambition. Si vous voulez, je, je réponds à la question sur la PAC. Oui. Euh, parce que, pour être très clair, um, I, I thought you would finish, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> pour, pour être, pour être uh, très clair, Cette réforme ne peut pas être faite sans nos agriculteurs. Il doit faire partie entière 
de cette réorientation. Mais en même temps, il faut qu'on comprenne qu'il faut réorienter. Et ça s'applique aussi bien au premier pilier qu'au deuxième pilier. Donc tous les deux, même dans la production et la restructuration, il faudra changer pas mal de choses. Et je crois que, par exemple, de demander aux États membres d'avoir des projets pour une agriculture écologique, c'est très important, très important. Je crois aussi qu'il qu faut avoir un programme très considérable pour le reboisement euh, en Europe. Et là aussi, euh, les agri nos agriculteurs auront un rôle primordial à jouer. Donc je crois qu'il faut réorienter la PAC, il ne faut pas l'abandonner du tout, au contraire. Et en plus, je l'ai déjà dit ce matin euh, dans une autre occasion, si on travaille à la Commission européenne, on a un demi-siècle de PAC derrière nous. C'est une responsabilité qui continuera. On a cette responsabilité sur les épaules et on a aussi la responsabilité de réorienter cette grande politique européenne vers une direction qui est soutenable et qui donne une perspective à tous ceux et celles qui dépendent pour leur vie de la PAC et euh, qui, euh, dont on a besoin pour créer euh, une situation socialement acceptable euh, dans les zones rurales de l'Union européenne. Il hein. ne faut pas se faire d'illusions. On a des défis énormes dans nos villes, mais les défis dans les zones rurales ne sont pas moindres. Et là aussi, vous venez de l'Italie, là on aura, euh, comme en Espagne d'ailleurs et en Grèce, on aura un enjeu incroyable pour s'adapter aux, aux nouvelles euh, conditions climatiques. Euh, la désertification est un, en, est, est un enjeu incroyable pour nos agriculteurs. Donc c'est comme ça qu'il faudra réorienter euh, la PAC, et la PAC, dans ce sens, euh, peut faire une partie intégrante du changement euh, euh, fondamental dans notre société. Voilà. Ben oui, je crois, je crois qu'on a de moins en moins de problèmes à convaincre nos agriculteurs que ce qu'ils font doit être soutenable. Là, je n'ai pas trop de soucis. Mais en même temps, dans le programme, on appelle ça en anglais « from farm to fork » de, 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 de fourchette à assiette, c'est comme ça hein, en français J'essaie d'allitérer un petit peu. Là aussi, il faut augmenter la qualité de la nourriture et en même temps augmenter la possibilité de nos agriculteurs de faire partie de ça. Parce qu'une agriculture et une consommation qui est uniquement dirigée vers « on ne paie rien » ou très très peu pour notre nourriture, sans regarder la qualité, c'est le passé. On ne peut pas continuer comme ça. Et je crois que pour l'agriculture européenne, viser sur qualité, euh, sur euh, être soutenable sur euh, santé, c'est le futur, aussi bien pour le secteur que pour les citoyens. Thank you so much. So we'll close this discussion for today and immediately carry on with the midday. Thank you.